Hola, Alasmites. Welcome back to the podcast where we boat out to the middle of the ocean, hoping our captain knows where they're going. Lucky for you, I, your host, Sam McNeely, am your captain. But unlucky for you, I never know where I'm going. Anyways, thanks for joining me this week as we've got another great white shark of an episode, and it's nearly as big as one because it's coming to you as a two-parter. But before I introduce our guest, let's gab. First, thanks to all you returning listeners, and welcome new Elasmites. This is such a good episode, but we've got some other great ones, so go check those out too. Thank you to all you fabulous Elasmite Patreon donors. Your donations literally make this show possible, and without you, I couldn't be doing what I love for the things in this world that just can't speak up for themselves. And if you'd like to give, you can find our Patreon page at patreon.com slash elasmospod. I'm working on some fun extra content and ways to interact with me and this podcast, so make sure to give so that you can be a part of all that fun. Thanks so much, and again, you can give at patreon.com slash elasmospod. And please rate and review this podcast, and then send your rating and review to elasmospod at gmail.com so that you can be entered into a drawing for a fun surprise from our guests from episode one. You can share this podcast on social media, tagging elasmospod, and still get two entries into the drawing. So rate, review, share on social media, and email me at elasmospod at gmail.com. You can find the Elasmos Podcast on Instagram and Twitter, at Elasmos Pod. You can find our Facebook page, the Elasmos Podcast, A Shark's Universe, on Facebook. And you can find our website online at elasmospod.com. And last little thing, please send your adventure stories to me for our listeners episode. You can email those to me at elasmospod at gmail.com so that your story can be told and to help encourage ecotourism and nature exploration. All right, now onto this week's guest. He might be best described as coming from everywhere. He's probably got the coolest hobby of anyone that I know, and that's photographing great white sharks. You might know him on Instagram as I photograph sharks, as he has hundreds of thousands of followers. We covered a lot of ground in this first part from adventures in Germany to breaching great white sharks, diving with a 40-foot shark, how he got into photography, the art of journaling, cool shark identification techniques, miraculous shark healing abilities, and of course, funny masks. So get ready, last mites, for this epic episode with shark enthusiast George Probst. This is episode 6, part 1. This is about as presentable as I get, if I'm being honest, but, you know, <laughs> you, you work with what you got. Hey, me too, me too. I like the shirt, though. Yeah, that's uh, that's one of our favorite ladies out there at Guadalupe, so. Yeah, I know. I've heard a lot about Lucy. She seems like a famous one. Yeah, she's a rock star. She's one of those sharks that when she shows up, everybody wants to get in the water, and sometimes, you know, you've been you've been waiting all day, and it's like, somebody wants to take your your spot like (laughs) i've been freezing my butt off all day waiting for this you you can wait a little while but that's how it goes so just how like everyone likes to start out conversations we started out talking about how we so enjoy the work from home t-shirt and shorts attire and lucy is a very famous 16 foot female great white shark that frequently visits guadalupe And she's well known for her broken caudal fin, which is just her tail. So the top part of her fin is just bent down, and that makes her really distinguishable. But George has obviously seen her a lot, because he has her on a shirt. And just a quick side note, this episode was recorded back in 2021. So when we refer to this year, we mean 2021, and last year, 2020. So we can all give a huge thank you to my anxiety and the great transition from college life into adulthood that kept me from putting these episodes out in a timely manner. Yay, thank you, adulthood. Blech. And George mentioned later in 2021, they were able to go back to Guadalupe and they identified so many new great whites. So finally, some great news in this world. 
So I just want to start out by getting a feel for what your background was, like where you're from and how you grew up. I'm an army brat, so I grew up all over the place. I was born in Jersey, then we moved to Panama and Central America. I was there until I was almost four. Then we lived in the D.C. metro area until I was seven. Then I lived in Germany until I was ten. Holy cow. Then back to the D.C. metro area. (laughs) Um, I came to school at Virginia Tech here in Blacksburg, Virginia, and I've been here ever since. So bounced around quite a bit as a child, and I'd like to bounce around a bit some more as an adult, but I've just kind of gotten stuck in a rut here in Blacksburg with Mm-hmm. having to pay bills and, and be an adult. So. Yeah, I know the adult life comes with responsibilities that I wish I didn't have to deal with. <laughs> yeah. It's funny, when I was younger and we had to move so often, you know, it was one of those things where you kind of regretted having to do that. And in hindsight, it's something that I greatly appreciate because I got to see different parts of the world. And, uh, you know, I mean, when we lived in, in Germany, you could drive to different countries for a day trip and obviously we don't have that luxury here (laughs) and it's something i look back on now i'm like oh that was actually pretty cool even though yeah really my brother and i would you know kind of groan at my dad waking us up super early on a saturday morning to go (laughs) drive to do a you know a, a 10k walk in france somewhere oh my gosh that's so cool what part of germany did y'all live in uh we were in a little town called osthofen which is along the Rhine. It's uh, almost midway between Frankfurt and Mannheim. Oh, okay. I asked because I went to Germany a few years ago back with a church group where we went and followed the path of Martin Luther for the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And it was so fun. We first went to Berlin, then down to Wittenberg, and then all the way down to Halle. And it it was so cool. I loved it. Did you go to Worms by chance? Where was it? Worms, it's spelled worms. Oh, (laughs) no, we stayed mostly in the northern part, so I think the farthest south we went was Halle, so right near Leipzig. That's where he had one of his most famous speeches, and there's a huge statue, a huge bronze statue of him in the city square. That's where I went to elementary school, so we were in a kind of a little suburb of there, yeah. No way. All I know is it's beautiful, and I want to go back. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned Berlin because when I lived there, it was still divided. It was still uh, wow. East and West Germany, and you know that's another thing that sticks in my head as a as a kid. Because when you would go to Berlin, you had to travel through East Germany, and it was I mean the the difference between West Germany and East Germany at the time was quite striking, and it was something that stuck with me. Yeah, that's that's really unbelievable. And it's crazy how much change has happened in just such a short amount of time. Yeah, which is good to see. It was definitely a positive change. Oh, yeah, of course. And so throughout all of your traveling and growing up, what was it that first got you interested in science? Um, I've always been interested in animals and sharks in particular. Interestingly enough, I, through up through most of my adult life, have been terrified of sharks. Uh, fascinated with them, but <laughs> terrified of them. <laughs> really? And uh, I've always been interested in animals in general, and sharks are just kind of... You, you, haven't, you haven't met too many little kids that didn't go through a shark <laughs> phase and a dinosaur phase, and I never really outgrew either one of those. And, you know, when I got into my adult years, it's like, I want to see a great white shark before I die, because that's... I I just want to see one. Mm -hmm. And when I was 32, I had some money set aside for something that I ended up not needing it for anymore. And I thought, I'm going to use that money to go go see a great white shark Mm, with the intent of it just being that one time thing. Because it's like, (laughs) I just want to be able to say I saw one. And, you know, after looking at different places, it was like, oh, there's this place, Guadalupe, which wasn't really a household name for white sharks at the time. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, it, it was starting to pick up in popularity, but, like, not as well known then as it is now, obviously. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was like, man, that's, you know, not too far off the 
Mexican coast compared to having to fly to South Africa or Australia. And so I was like, I'll give that a try. I talked to my brother and said, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. Are you interested? And he's like, well, let me think about it. And I was like, no, <laughs> I, I'm doing this. I'm, I'm going to book this like tonight. I need I, I need an answer. And he was like, yeah, I'll go. So he ended up going with me as well. Oh, that's but, awesome. You know, even getting out to Guadalupe, which is a pretty good trek from the Mexican coast, you know, it can be 20, 21 hours, depending on what boat you're on. There's a really? boat that can get out there in about 14 now, but the one I typically go on is it's about a, you know, typically about a 20 hour boat ride. Hello and welcome to the land of misfit cartographers, where we try to find out where everything is on a map because we have no clue. So I first looked up Guadalupe and I didn't know how to spell it. So of course I spelled it wrong the first time. And it took me to a French region. It's It says the French department. I don't know what that means. But the French department of Guadalupe in the Caribbean Sea, which is just like southeast of Puerto Rico. And I was like, what? Why would you go from Mexico? But then I realized it's probably misspelled. And so I looked up Guadalupe sharks. And that took me to the Guadalupe that George is talking about which is about 250 miles off the coast of the Baja Peninsula, just below California. So if you're like me, just give yourself a nice good face palm slap to the forehead and then a pat on the back for eventually figuring it out. But even getting out there, I was just thinking, if I just see one shark, mm -hmm. I'll be happy. I can come home happy. <laughs> and, um, you know, we don't see a lot of natural breaches out of Guadalupe, not quite like they see in South Africa. And you kind of have to be looking at the right spot at the right time for a breach anywhere. But as we were approaching the island, there was myself and I think like three other people on the bow of the boat coming in and full natural breach, like just this perfect breach what? right in front of us. I mean, not no super way. close, but like, and I, I was like, I saw, I saw a white shark. I, you know, we can turn around <laughs> and I would be happy. That's it. Not even having any concept of what it was like to experience them underwater. And, uh, That's crazy. After being in the water with them for just a few minutes, I was like, "It's like, man, this this is where it's at, you know. This I, I want to do this, yeah, a lot more." <laughs> and um, that was kind of the catalyst for me getting certified to dive because I the when I first went out there, I just did surface cage diving, which you don't have to be certified for. Hmm. I would recommend anybody thinking about going surface cage diving to still get certified, just so that you're prepared for being breathing underwater in general. I just feel like... <laughs> yeah, it's a whole different world. Yeah. I mean, the first time I took a breath underwater was, you know, from a hookah in a cage what? in an area surrounded by great white sharks. So it's, oh my God. you know, it's just like, <laughs> okay, there's a lot going on right now. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, after you take a couple breaths and you're like, okay, that was weird, but now I'm kind of used to it. It's... Mm -hmm. it, it felt like just a second home being underwater. And, uh, I mean, being underwater for me in general, not necessarily even diving out at Guadalupe, but it's just, it's a very peaceful experience. You know, you kind of sh shut the world off and it, the water just washes the weight of the world off of you. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it, you know, it, it didn't take long on that first trip to, to go, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do this again. And, um, my first, dive trip was that cage diving trip to Guadalupe where I did surface cage diving and I got certified a couple months later and did some whale shark diving in Belize Wow! to celebrate getting certified. What a celebration trip. Yeah. And it, it was, uh, we saw four whale sharks there, which if you've gone to some place like, uh, some of the places in Mexico during the summer where they have those huge aggregations, you might think four whale sharks isn't that cool, but it is. Yeah. Oh, oh my God. Of course. Yeah. I've been lucky enough to go to the Georgia Aquarium and just even be able to see a whale shark, but you've been diving with them in the wild. If people knock that off as not cool, their adrenaline junkie level is just way too high for me. Yeah. And one of the ones that came in was, was close to 40 foot. So it was, a, it was a cool experience. That's freaking awesome. I just don't know what to say about that. Now, so what was your first experience in the water with a great white shark like? 
What did that feel like? Surreal. Especially as somebody who grew up on Jaws and Mm. had more negative stereotypes of of sharks than positive ones. I I feel like we still have a lot of negative stereotypes with sharks, but at least now there's a lot more documentaries versus, you know, I'm, I'm 47. So when I was a kid was like seventies and eighties and there, there wasn't a whole lot of pro shark media out there. (laughs) Not really. (laughs) You know, and you get that just, that stuff sticks with you in your head. If that's all you're exposed to is that, man, if you get in the water, a shark's going to try and get you. And you know, you get in the water and half of these, more than half the sharks don't even care that you're there. You know, <laughs> you're lucky when you get a curious shark that wants to come in and check things out and, you know, see what's going up with the, the bubble blowing neoprene clad animals in the water. <laughs> and, uh, you know, those, those are the sharks that we love to see because they're going to come uh-huh. in and give you better photo opportunities. But yeah, most of the time they, they're just like, yeah, I'm going to stay away from whatever's going on over there. So. <laughs> perspectives change very rapidly and i think that's that's very common for a lot of people out at guadalupe when they have you know i I guess we all have preconceived notions about how an experience is going to be an experience with an animal that's you know not always portrayed realistically i think it's i think it's a big surprise for a lot of people when they get out there just how calm the experience is for the most part Oh, I believe it. I mean, I would imagine like right before you go into the cage, your, your heart rate's going, you're, you're anticipating a big shark and in like a jaws like moment, whether you want to or not, you know? And especially if you've never done it before. Yeah. I remember thinking, what if when I'm climbing down the ladder to get in the cage, one jumps up and grabs me? You know, it's just, <laughs> you know, it's something that would happen in Jaws, but not something yeah, really. that would happen for real. Yeah. Yeah. And then you feel stupid about it afterwards because you're just like, <laughs> yeah, that, that's ridiculous, you know? <laughs> the egg on my face. And so have you moved any from cage diving to open water diving with the Great Whites? At a Guadalupe, it's, you're restricted to cage diving. I do... I do open water diving elsewhere. I've never had an encounter with a white shark going over open water diving. I've never encountered a white shark any place other than Guadalupe. Mm. I've done open water diving with bull sharks, whale sharks, nurse sharks, sand tiger sharks. Wow. I've been around when blue sharks were around and black tips were around and not seen them. And other people have pictures, you know, and I'm just like, ah. Oh, that's the worst. Like, how did I miss that? (laughs) But, um... Yeah, and I mean, I love open water diving. It's being in a cage is a little bit frustrating if you're used to mm. open water diving because, I mean, you're confined. It's 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 the difference between having to be stuck like in your car to look at wildlife versus being able to move around and right. you know one of the one of the great joys of diving is to be able to move in three dimensions and you know when you're in a cage you can't do that you. It's, I, I equate photographing sharks from a cage as to kind of the equivalent of if you're doing bird photography, doing that from a blind where you're Mm. hunkered down in this, you know, one spot and you just, you're at the mercy of the animals to come in to where you're at and hopefully within your, how you've got your shot set up. I was going to say, I bet you have to rely a lot on the curiosity of the animal. Yeah, and again, that's why we like we like those curious sharks, you know, because they're going to come in and create the the better photo opportunities for you. The the ones that are really curious about the cameras are going to give you those kind of up close and personal shots that I think kind of capture the unique qualities about an individual shark. And that's another thing that you pick up on if you you know out at Guadalupe we see some of the same sharks year after year. I mean, we talked about Lucy earlier on. And, uh, you know, you just get used to the certain traits and, and unique characteristics that some of those individuals have. And, you know, mm-hmm. there are sharks that we look forward to seeing every year. And if you don't see a shark on that, you know, on a trip, you're like kind of bummed out that you didn't see see that shark. And you're thinking, oh, I hope that shark's OK. Yeah, really. And do you kind of equate it to like seeing an old friend? Yeah. I mean, from my perspective, I'm, I'm not of the mindset that uh any sharks think that we're their friends, you know, (laughs) 
like I like to point out that I love sharks, but I, I realize they probably don't love me. As much as we want them to love us back, they they just probably don't. I imagine it like they think of us like we think of a cockroach in our room. Just an annoying pest that shouldn't be here. Y- yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's kind of a... It, it gets kind of tricky because I when I'm talking to people about sharks, I don't want to paint them out in a negative way. But at the same time, it's like, you got to be realistic. The way a shark is viewing the world is significantly different than the way a person getting in the water is viewing the world. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's like a certain level of respect and understanding that we as humans need to have when getting in the water with with animals that are apex predators, especially in that environment compared to us. Yeah, at the end of the day, we're still we're in the water with wild animals. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a shark or a sea lion or even a tiny fish or a starfish or something, you know. You're in their habitat, they're a wild animal, and there there needs to be a level of respect. We're, we're guests at the end of the day. Ooh, I like that. I, I think that's a good way to look at it, like you're a guest in someone else's house. Yeah, definitely. I mean, a, a, another angle to look at that from is when we're at Guadalupe, we get macro scad that come in really, really, really thick sometimes by the thousands, and wow. I mean, they just, they ruin the experience of being able to see the shark sometimes and photograph Mm. the shark and it's like in the back of my head like i'm just like oh these dang mackerel scad you know why don't you just get out of here and you have to (laughs) remind yourself it's like no this is their home too you know it's like you're a guest again hoping to see a shark and you know if mackerel scad happened to decide to be there too they have uh, just as much right to be there as the shark does, and and mm-hmm. more, a lot more than than we have to be there. So, <laughs> it, it's one of those things I have to constantly remind myself. It's like don't don't get mad at the mackerel scan. <laughs> okay, that needs to go on a shirt or a billboard or a hat or something. Don't get mad at the mackerel scad. Come on, please, someone make that. I would so support that. Yeah, I know. It's it's hard when, especially when you're a photographer and it's other animals get in the way of something that you're like, you're actually targeting. And so, yeah, I, I could imagine that that could get frustrating. But do you still get excited when you see other wildlife other than the great white sharks? Oh, absolutely. You know, mackerel scad, since they're so thick and abundant there, like they... I I don't look forward to seeing those. I know <laughs> that I'm going to see them. And, but there are some times when they're in there so thick that you just can't help be, be impressed by just being surrounded by that many of a species. But, you know, I'm, I'm excited when I see just about any type of animal. So mm-hmm. whatever is coming in, it beats sitting at my desk looking at work. I would prefer to be underwater watching mackerel scad just ruin my photos, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even seeing mackerel scad is better than work. <laughs> now, could you talk a little bit about your background in photography? I am self-taught. I the only yeah the only background that I have from an education standpoint. I did a little bit of work in the dark room for my school newspaper, and I was not the photographer for the paper. I did kind of grunt work, developing film and that type of stuff, and didn't really pick up photography until I was probably early 2000s, kind of when the digital boom started picking up. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. You can take photos and have them right then and don't have to spend a bunch of money on, you know, developing and prints and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I got my first DSLR, I think, in 2005. So if you're like me and don't know anything in the world but are here to learn... DSLR is short for Digital Single Lens Reflex and can have multiple lenses that are interchanged. And so it's good for entry-level photographers, but also for the pros that want to get more lenses and get the perfect shot that they know they're going for. Look at that. We learned something together. How special. And when I went out to Guadalupe, first couple times I went out there, I think my first three trips, I just had this little point and shoot and still hadn't really really delved into photography much you know i've taken a lot of online courses read a lot of books since then but like the first few trips i was just like eh, eh, you know (laughs) 
point and click, point and click, and 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 hope <laughs> things turn out okay. You know, which works if you've got good conditions and everything. You know, the stars align. You're going to get some good shots every once in a while doing that. Just luck of the draw. Mm-hmm. One of the things about learning some of the I don't want to say tricks, but learning what you're doing with photography is you can sometimes get a shot if you know how to use your camera correctly or, or know how to work in post that, you know, definitely would not have been a possibility without that knowledge because you're shooting in more difficult conditions or, you know, imperfect conditions. I think, I think that's the benefit of kind of knowing your camera and knowing some of the principles of photography where you can kind of take a, a bad situation and still get a, a decent shot or you know sometimes even a shot that when you were shooting it at the time you thought was going to turn out one way and it's like well it's not going to work that way how about let's try this instead and uh yeah one of my more popular shots is a shot that i was anticipating shooting in a different way and it just wasn't going to work and then i it was in my throwaways because i was like ah it didn't turn out the way i wanted it to and i revisited it about eight months later and there was a, a quality of the light and the, the shark was a silhouette and it just, you know, I, I was not trying to shoot a silhouette at the time. I just couldn't get, get things how I wanted to. And so I didn't even think about trying to do any type of adjustment and post with that. And I went back and revisited it. And now it's a lot of people tell me, oh, that's my favorite shot of yours. And wow. I'm like, yeah, it sat in my throwaways for eight months. So. <laughs> and that's another thing that you have to take into consideration as a photographer too you know it's subjective a lot of my favorite shots aren't super popular with other people because you know a lot of my favorite shots kind of resonate with me and the experience or perhaps a particular individual shark Mm. or what was going on that day where and that brings up a, a memory of that experience and that's why that shot's important to me And other people, you know, I'm like, hey, this is one of my favorite shots. And, you know, I'll post it on social media and it just does nothing compared to stuff that, you know, (laughs) there's some stuff that I post on Instagram where I'm like, this is over-processed trash. Let's see how it does. (laughs) And, and, you know, it'll blow up and people are like, this is the best shot you've ever taken. And I'm like, oh. But, you know, again, it's subjective. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely is. But looking back through your own photographs... Is it almost kind of like a diary? Like looking back at the photos, can you remember like each day, each each situation, remember how that shark was was acting that day? Do your photographs kind of feel like a dive diary? Yeah, for a lot of photos, that, that's definitely the case. Not all of them, of course, but there are definitely photos where it's like, oh yeah, that was, you know, that day was awesome. That's got to be so fun to be able to relive through your photographs. I've started journaling within this past year, and it's amazing what just writing down like five sentences about what happened that day. Like, for example, when I look back on like May 24th of 2021 in my journal and I read the paragraph, I have an image through it. I can basically relive that day. That's really cool that you can do that with your photographs, too, and with your with your dives. I'm sure that's like such a fun experience that you get to relive because it's got to be so thrilling the first time but then being able to relive that memory not just through your own head but also through an image that is able to provide you that background that's that's really awesome i love that absolutely yeah and when i first started i mean that first trip i bought that little underwater point and shoot just kind of to have memories and to be able to show other people, hey, this is what we saw. And so that's kind of how my photography was geared early on. And it's that's definitely a, still a big part of it. I want to be able to share, you know, my experiences with people who might not get the chance to go out there and, right. you know, help to educate them about sharks and white sharks in particular. Yeah, absolutely. But also one of the things that I spend a fair amount of time on with my photography now is is contributing to the photo identification project out at Guadalupe. Really? So trying to identify new new individuals. Uh, Marine Conservation Science Institute heads up that project, and they've been working on it since 2001, I think. Man, that's a long time. And 
they've identified 366 unique individuals out of Guadalupe since that started. No way. And That's crazy. I started contributing to that uh, about five years ago. So now when we are out there, we're specifically looking for new sharks. When we get done with the trip, myself and one of my other photographer friends will go through every single photo we took and make sure we are able to identify <laughs> every shark in every photo. And if we have unknowns, then we list those out and that's so cool. Go through some of the sharks we can recognize right away. Like we don't even have to go through the the photo ID books to look them up because it's you've seen that shark year after year and you just recognize them right away. Mm -hmm. But the ones that we don't recognize right off the bat, we'll go into the books and go through every single shark. And, um, you know, if it doesn't match up to one, then we know we've got a new shark. And in order for that shark to get cataloged, you have to have a right profile shot, left profile shot, because we, you, you got to have a clear look at that counter shading pattern. Cause that's, Mm. asymmetrical and it's unique to each shark so if you get the right and left side then you can pretty much identify most sharks i mean there are a couple angles you can take a photo of a shark from and you're not going to be able to get an id but like if you can capture just the gill region on the left side um and that's a known shark you're you've got a pretty good chance of being able to match it up because uh there's all, usually a lot of detail and around the gill area um above the pelvic fin and then we focus on the lower caudal fin quite a mm. bit because some of the sharks have white markings, unique white markings there too. Oh, okay. But, um, That's so cool. I love the identification part of it. That's wild that they're each unique and that those little jagged counter shading patterns is what can be used to identify them. Now, does that counter shading pattern change any as the animal grows? It does a little bit, but not significantly enough that you can... Like if you if you have a shark uh, photo of a shark from ten years ago and that shark shows up again ten years later, you'll be able to match it up. That's too cool. There there are some like little small changes and nuances. Um, one of the things that we've noticed with a few sharks that had white patterns on their lower caudal fin is they'll start to fill in with gray pigmentation. Hmm. And that gets a little bit tricky because if you get in the mindset of oh I. When I'm looking for that shark, I'm looking for this white marking on his lower caudal fin. I'm, I've seen that with it, at least two sharks that I'm aware of. And I've never seen the opposite of that, though, where, like, huge white markings appear there. So I think it's probably just one way. As far as that's just based on my observation, I don't know that for certain. Mm -hmm. But um, as a whole, that counter shading pattern remains consistent enough okay. over the years that we can... We can match those up. Gotcha. So the photo identification project started in 2001, but there's photos back to at least 99 that they have in the identification database. And, the you know, the photos from 99, they can match up to a Shoot. shark that was seen 20 years later. That's impressive. Still have a matching pattern. That counter shading pattern, you know, we like to say is, is kind of the white shark equivalent of a, a fingerprint. Yeah, I had heard that some sharks' countershading patterns can be used to, to help identify individuals. But scars and injuries can also be used for identification purposes too, right? Yeah, the tricky thing about injuries, though, is since white sharks heal so well, you don't really want to rely on those. A shark like Lucy, you know, she's got a permanent injury to her caudal fin. She's had that since 2007. Mm. You can recognize her right away. But uh, one of the examples I like to point out, there's a, a shark named Sadface, <laughs> and he had he had some scars on him that resembled like a frowny face, like two eyes and then a and a frown. Oh, really? And that's that's his name in the photo ID book, and <laughs> he doesn't have that those scars completely healed up, so he doesn't have them now. And so what? if you're going in the water expecting to see that to identify him, it's not going to be there. Wow, he's actually one of the sharks that has a had a white marking on his lower caudal fin that is has filled in quite a bit too. Oh, that's cool to see. I thought I had heard of a shark called Sadface, and I was wondering why. I was so confused why it was called Sadface because all these great whites have a big bright white smile. <laughs> so, last I checked, I haven't seen any frowning great whites, but now that makes sense. 
my friend Melissa and I refer to sad face as happy face. <laughs> <'Cause we're> like, <laughs> it, whenever you talk about him like sad face, people are like, oh, like, no, it's, it's not because he looks sad. He just had a sad face scar on the side of him. I mean, he's happy now because it's healed, so. Yeah. Yeah, but, um, you know, and the, the converse of that is true, too. You might have a shark that's in the database that's squeaky clean, and the next time you see it might be just covered in scars. And it's like, well, you can't be focused on the scars because they're not going to remain consistent across the years. Uh, places where we see kind of permanent injuries to tend to last would be around the, r- around the gills and the fins. You know, the, the fins don't have a, a nerve or blood supply, so... Oh, I didn't know that. Damage to the fins can tend to be permanent. That being said, after the 2019 season, I had a shark that I missed in the ID book because when I went through, I skipped over one that had a huge slash in his dorsal fin that was like almost down to the body from the about midway. Oh my gosh, that's nuts. Down, I mean, just a huge slash and it looked like something that definitely would not heal. That's what his photo in the ID book looked like, and it had completely healed the next year, and was he had an intact dorsal fin. And if you looked closely enough at it, you could see like a faint line from where that cut was, but it had healed back. Wow! And um, that's crazy. I was really surprised by that, and I talked to Nicole at Marine Conservation Science Institute because I was like, Uh man, how often does that happen? And and she (laughs) said that they know it had happened with at least one other shark where that had healed up man so even fin injuries aren't always permanent yeah but um and speaking of fins like they can use the fins also to help identify a shark and they do that by the ridge pattern on the back oh cool i know and um i think in south africa they they tend to rely on that more often than counter shading pattern because the Mm. visibility underwater is not always great there so they can get shots of the dorsal fin above the surface and and match those up there's going to be some variation with that as well because, again, mm-hmm. you can get damage to the dorsal fins. Um, parasitic copepods get on the dorsal fins and can kind of modify, create little ridges of their own back there as well. Oh, my heart jumped when he said copepods. Okay, I know I love sharks, but copepods also hold a very special place in my heart because I got to do some research with them at the Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences in Maine, and they're super cool. I didn't get to work on parasitic copepods, though. I got to work on little tiny ones, like about as thick as your fingernail. They're so cute. But these parasitic copepods, they sound kind of gnarly, so that's a different animal. Oh, and sorry, if you don't know what copepods are, like I didn't know before I started my internship, copepods are zooplankton, and they typically feed on phytoplankton, so like plants and algae that are free-floating in the water. And the copepods are kind of just free-floating themselves. They can't really swim that well. They can move up and down really well, but they can't really go against the current, which makes them plankton. But for as little recognition as they get, they're probably one of the most important animals on the planet. So go sharks, but I'm also team copepod. And also, copepod is just a fun word to say. Go on, go ahead and say it. It's okay. People on the subway might think you're crazy, but they're also going to learn a new word. Okay... Where were we again? Oh, right. We were talking about parasitic copepods and how they can screw up the identification process for using a dorsal fin to identify the individual. Yeah, I guess they could just make things a little more difficult to identify. Yeah, I I feel like it's way easier to use a countershading pattern if you can get a good shot underwater. I would not want to have to identify a shark based on dorsal fin ridges. And that's just looking at the ridges on the back of the dorsal fin, like towards the tail? Yeah, on the back end of it. Huh, I didn't realize that those were unique to the shark. I mean, I guess they're unique enough if they're able to be used to identify each individual shark. Yeah, I'm not sure how confident I would be doing that. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty confident using counter shading patterns. There, there have been times where, you know, I'll post a picture comparing a shark over course of a couple years and people are like that's not the same shark and i'm like (laughs) it is and you know you have to show them the comparison between several identifying markings on the Mm. uh, counter shading pattern they're like oh you're right yeah i kind of feel like you would know best since you've kind of spent the most time with them but you know that's just my personal opinion so 
there there are people that sometimes don't relent and then i'm just like eh, i mean i don't know what to tell you <laughs> maybe they don't realize you have all the shark identification books and you basically have a personal fbi file on each shark who knows who knows but so is shark photography just like a little side hustle or is that your main job no nah, it's just a hobby for me my my main job is working at an IT firm, sitting at this very desk right here, <laughs> being unhappy about it most of the time. <laughs> at least you're surrounded by your photographs, and you've got a calendar behind you, you've got pictures all around you. At least you can still live vicariously through your own adventures. I've got a stack of the identification books back here. Folks won't be able to see this on the podcast, but I've got the, my shark sunglasses. His office is literally what I want my entire house to be like. Where it's here shark, there shark, everywhere shark shark. And while he's basically giving me a virtual tour of his shark office, he pulls out a mask that has a shark on it, and it's just got its jagged white teeth all in front. I mean, it makes it look like your mouth is a shark jaw. Oh, and speaking of funny masks, I made what I personally think is the best mask. I had just a plain black mask, and I painted like a pair of jeans on it, and then I sewed a zipper that I had, you know, because I keep random things, as I do, <laughs> and I sewed it into the crotch so that I could unzip the middle, and I could put a straw through it if I wanted to. It's it's not really that practical, and I'm kind of huffing acrylic paint, so, so it's probably not that great for me, but it's really funny to wear because the zipper's just hanging out right in front of my mouth. I enjoy it. I'll have to post that to the Elasmos Instagram. And if you have any funny or crazy creative masks, please send them my way. I've seen some really funny ones. All right, so back to the mask that he has. This mask is of a shark that's named Bruce. I'll just let him explain. So here's George. That's uh, one of Guadalupe's famous sharks. He's in the he's in the photo ID book as as Bruce, the shark from Jaws. But the the boat that I tend to go out to Guadalupe with uh, most frequently, the Solmar Five, they call them Zapata on that boat. Give them a good Mexican name. There's a lot of Mexican sharks with without very Mexican names. So. Hmm. Yeah, I can imagine. That's funny, Zapato. If my Spanish is still good, I think that just means shoe. But anyways, so if photography is just kind of like a hobby for you, how did you make that transition from being just a casual photographer to helping out with their shark identification program? It, you know, it was a kind of a growing process from when I first started out out there. Mm -hmm. When I first went out to Guadalupe, there was a, a research biologist on the boat that I first started going out there with named Scott Davis, who's also just an incredible photographer. And I remember sitting with him on the boat on that first trip, like going through some of his photography and just like, I was like, man, this guy's stuff is as good as anything I've ever seen. And uh, it's like, man, I, it'd be cool to be able to take a photo like that, like the type that Scott takes. So that's kind of what I've strived for. I'm still not as good as Scott, <laughs> but uh yeah, and I and I never will be, but uh, <laughs> friendly competition. He kind of got out of the um, shark business for a little while, not long after I just started diving. But um, he kind of passed the reins off to you. Not really. Just things kind of just went separately. But he's he's on Instagram now, and uh, I kind of reconnected with him there. So we, you know, comment uh, back and forth on Instagram, and he's. His photography is still mind blowing, so and he's doing he's doing amazing things with his photography. So. Oh, nice! I'll have to check him out. You know, it, and there were other photographers on the trip as well, where it was just like, man, it'd be cool to be able to take a photo like that. So that's why I got my dive certification to get better at the diving aspect of it and then just started really kind of reading up on everything I could on photography and you know practice 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 is is key to photography too you got to take a lot of at least I have to take a lot of bad pictures to take a good picture so. <laughs> all part of good day's work I'm a I'm a trial and error type guy so I was just about to say I would bet trial and error is probably one of the best and I mean most common ways to really amp up your photography game 
Yeah, so, you know, and it's a continuous process. I mean, I'm, I'm still learning things, and I have a lot more to learn. I'm, I'm sure that there are probably plenty of professional photographers that look at my stuff and are just like, yeah, you <laughs> haven't learned much. You, you got a lot, lot to learn. <laughs> I, I would just imagine that photography is one of those things. Photography is kind of like science. You, you can't know it all. So there's always going to be more. And that's probably one of the more attractive things to it is you can always learn more. You know, it's, um, I think it's important to be able to show the sharks in a more representative way of how they're actually behaving versus, I mean, a lot of people tend to focus on sharks going after bait and getting those open jaw shots, which are cool. I mean, I, I get that they're dramatic and I can tell you they definitely get a lot of interest on social media because that's what people expect to see i guess from sharks is them biting stuff but they're not swimming around biting stuff like all the time that's such a small percentage of, of their behavior that uh i just that's what i was interested in when i first started taking photographs out there because again that's what people expect and that's what you were that's what you were taught that that this is how a shark behaves and uh by about 2010 i was just like we're not really telling the whole story of sharks if if we're just focusing on this type of photography. So I try and I try and stay away from that. So that was the hilarious and talented photographer George Probst. But isn't it great that we're going to hear more from him next week with part two? So be sure to tune in for that. And you can find George's website, sharkpics.com, online. And you can follow him on Instagram at iPhotographSharks and on Twitter at George Probst. Probst is spelled P-R-O-B-S-T. So be sure to tune in to next week's episode for part two. And let me tell you, it's just as good and just as funny. And also informative, of course. And so you can find this podcast on Patreon at patreon.com slash elasmospod. And thank you to all of those that have already given. It really means a lot, and it helps me keep doing what I love. And it's really the only way that I can keep doing this. So your support really means the world to me. And as a little incentive, I'm working on some fun extra content for those of you that do give. So please be sure to check that out, because it's going to be some great ways to interact with me and the podcast a little bit more than these weekly episodes. So again, that's patreon.com slash elasmuspod. And please don't forget to rate and review this podcast on whatever platform you're viewing it on. And please send that rating and review to me at elasmospod at gmail.com so that you can be entered into a drawing to try to win a fun prize. Which, who doesn't love a fun prize? And if you've already sent your rating and review to me, you can share this podcast on social media, tagging elasmospod to get two extra entries into the drawing. And you can find the Elasmos Podcast on Instagram and Twitter at elasmospod. You can find our Facebook page, the Elasmos Podcast, a shark's universe on Facebook. And you can find us online at elasmuspod.com. And I want to thank Paul McNeely for setting up that website. It makes me so excited seeing that we have a website. And thank you to Wes McNeely and Connor Blake for making the amazing theme song that I still love so much. I never won't love it. Wes can be found at wes.mcneely1 on Instagram and Wes McNeely on YouTube. And you can find me on Instagram at smcneely4335. All right, now for my little weekly update. So my brother Wes turned me on to this podcast called Unbelievable with Justin Brierly. And I think it's pretty popular, but I had never heard of it before. And so it's really interesting. It's a religious podcast, but it's it's debating difficult concepts within Christianity. But they typically have someone that is Christian come on and debate difficult topics with someone who's not Christian. So it's really interesting to see different perspectives of religion, whether you are Christian or not. And I really recommend it because it's gotten me to think about my spirituality and where I stand on difficult concepts. And so I think even if you're not a Christian, it's a good podcast to listen to just because it gets you to think. And as I've gone through my own difficult journey of unlearning purity culture, I think this is a great podcast to kind of get different perspectives from the usual, you only hear one side of things. At least that's how I was, really. Or at least there's one side that's really vocal and another side that's pretty quiet. So I think it's fascinating and I think it's definitely worth a listen regardless of your religion because it just gets you to think about difficult concepts and the hard to talk about 
conversations. Because they get to have those conversations for you, which I can appreciate. It's fun to be a fly on the wall for those conversations and not always stuck in the middle of it. So you kind of get the benefits without any repercussions. So it's pretty good. But anyways, I think you should check it out. This isn't an ad for them. It's just something that's really interested me. And it's gotten me to think more about difficult topics that we probably run into in our day-to-day lives. So that's just my two cents. I think it's a really interesting show. But thanks for listening in, Elasmites. It's been great having you on for this first part episode with George Probst. I'm so excited for next week's second part. It's so good. I love it, and you're going to love it too. All right, I'll see you all back here next week for another episode of the Elasmos Podcast. Later, skaters. Thank you.